Peace be with you. Now, I'm hoping wherever you are um, that you responded to that by saying and also with you because um, that is one of my favourite things about being an Anglican minister that I can be anywhere and I can say peace be with you and people will respond. Today, as we enter the second week of Advent, peace is our focus. Last week, Reverend Pam spoke to us about the way fear gets in the way of human flourishing and how the hope that we have in Christ and the hope that we give each other as followers of Christ is the antidote for fear. We have been reminded again over this past week of the power of fear as we've all wondered what the Omicron variant of COVID is going to mean for our hope for a more open and relaxed Christmas and New Year. Fear can erode hope, but hope is the stronger force. Stubborn hope can also eradicate fear. And so can peace. Fear denies us peace, but stubbornly choosing to be a person of peace releases the grip of fear. If I am at peace with you, then I don't fear you, and you don't fear me. We, by choosing to be at peace, are not giving fear a foothold. And next week, we will reflect on joy. And we'll find the same thing. Fear erodes joy, but stubbornly insisting on being a joy giver, someone who sparks joy in the people around them, well, that leaves no room for fear. And then, in the fourth week of Advent, we reflect on the ultimate fear buster, love. There is no room for fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. In the battle between love and fear, it can look a bit dodgy every now and then, but ultimately love, love wins. Love always wins. So that is the message of Advent. God with us, God among us, God becoming one of us bringing hope, peace, joy, and love, and therefore utterly annihilating fear. Today we focus on peace. When I was growing up, I don't think we had a huge number of Christian books on the bookshelf, um, but there's one I remember being quite brightly coloured um, in sort of red letters on a black spine. I remember the words, Peace Child. Now, I don't think I ever read the book, but I knew what it was about because everybody knew about that book. It, because this is a story that revolutionised Christian thinking about mission. And I'm quite sure that some of you listening now have heard the story at least, if not read the book. Don and Carol Richardson began to work as medical missionaries in the 60s with the Sawi people in New Guinea. These were violent, cannibalistic people who thought that Richardson's message, the Richardson's message about God's love, made the Christian God seem soft and weak, not a God that they could respect. And so after years and years of danger, hard work, and no progress in communicating the gospel, the Richardsons wanted to leave. But the Sawi people didn't want to lose their doctor. So in order to convince the Richardsons to stay, they decided to demonstrate that they could 
live in peace. And this is how they made peace between the two tribes that had been at war. This was their tradition. People from one tribe took their own young children and gave them to the other tribe. And the other tribe did the same. So children were exchanged. And a child exchanged in this way was called a peace child. Putting aside for a moment the, um, the morality and of doing this and whether this is good for the children, um, what happened in New Guinea was that after years of struggling to find ways to talk about Jesus with these people, that they could understand, the Richardsons could now talk to them about God who gave God's own son to humanity as a peace child. And once they heard the Christian message in this way, thousands of them became Christians. This was a very key moment in the history of Christian mission because it hinted that in every culture, however hostile to the gospel it might seem, there is something that will connect with the story of Jesus. And I believe that's true of every individual as well, though it may take years and years and lots of hard work to get there. The days of Christian missionaries trying to scrape away cultural influences in order to impose the Christian message on a cultural blank slate, well, those days are gone. Today's missionaries are much more culturally sensitive and know they must listen to people for months and years before they can expect that those people will be ready to listen to them when they speak of the gospel of Christ. And that is a great thing. That's a great transition that's happened in Christian mission. But it's not actually why I told the story. I told the story so we could reflect on how that process might have worked. How was it that the peace children brought peace? Don Richardson wrote that it was because the Sawi people believed that if a man would actually give his own son to his enemies, then that man could be trusted. And when they heard that God had done just that, they suddenly decided that God could be trusted. And I'm not going to disagree with that assessment because he is someone who spent decades with these people. And I'm sure he was right, but I wonder if there's another factor in addition to that. A peace child, born in one tribe and raised in another, became the meeting place of those two groups. The child's identity was fundamentally both and. Both this tribe and that tribe, loved by both tribes, that child became the glue that held the two tribes together in peace. And when you think about it, that was actually the purpose of the temple in the Jewish scriptures. Today's reading from Malachi has this line, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The temple had been built to be a meeting place between heaven and earth, God's both and, God's peace child, something that was both of heaven and of earth, where God and humanity could meet in peace. But as we read Malachi, we see that something is wrong. Malachi wrote as though he thought God was not in the temple. Ezekiel had written earlier about God leaving the first temple 
because of the people's hostility. And then after that, the temple had been destroyed. By Malachi's time, even though the temple has been rebuilt, it seems that the Lord has not returned. By the end of the Jewish scriptures, we still have prophets speaking of a day in their future when the Lord will return to the temple. And that had not changed in the centuries leading up to the day when John the Baptist showed up to begin the fulfillment of that prophecy. The temple building was there, but it was not bringing peace. It was not acting as a peace child. It was not operating as the meeting place between God and humanity, because according to Malachi, they were still waiting for God to show up. But God had said through Malachi, I am sending my messenger to prepare a way before me. And then after a long wait, John the Baptist became the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And if that bit of the prophecy is being fulfilled, well, that implies that the rest of Malachi's prophecy was about to be fulfilled as well. The Lord was about to suddenly return to his temple. At last, heaven and earth would have a place to meet and make peace. But it wasn't what anyone expected. It turned out that the peace child was not going to be a building after all. The temple just wasn't up to the task of being the meeting place between heaven and earth. Something more radical was needed. The peace child was going to be a child. The place where heaven and earth could meet would be a person. When the Lord suddenly came to his temple, it wasn't to a building in Jerusalem, beautiful as the temple was, and sacred as it, as it had been to those people, but the Lord came to this temple, the temple that we all live in, the original temple, the temple that God set apart as sacred space at the start of Genesis. The temple that is all creation. The creator entered creation and the place of intersection, a particular intersection, the place where heaven and earth met most intently and made peace. That place was a human being, born within created space and time and placed in a manger in Jerusalem. Like the peace child, Jesus is fully in both tribes, fully God and fully human. From our perspective, we can say one of us is God. And from God's perspective, God the Trinity can say one of us is human. Now that almost sounds like blasphemy, I know, doesn't it? Except that it is in the Bible. A lot of Jesus' claims sounded like blasphemy to the religious authorities at the, in the first century. And it would be blasphemy if we made it up, but it was God's idea. We humans meet God in the human Jesus. And in him we make peace with our creator. He is our peace. A building could never really bring peace. The temple was a signpost, not the real thing. But Jesus brings heaven and earth together and gives us peace. Peace with God and peace with each other. Because if we 
all meet, if we all meet God in Jesus, then we are also at the same time all meeting each other in Jesus. And if we find peace there, peace with God, then we also find peace with each other. Imagine a group of people in a crowded room. Forget about COVID for a second. Picture Jesus in the centre of that room. And if each person in that room takes a step towards Jesus, what's happening to them in relation to, to each other? Well, as, as they all move toward Jesus, they are automatically also moving closer to each other. As we move closer to Jesus, yeah, spiritually as well as physically, um, we can't help moving closer to each other at the same time. As we all meet in Jesus, we find peace with each other as well as peace with God. And there will be a day when peace is fully restored in every dimension of life. And we look forward to that day and keep believing Jesus' promise that he is bringing it about. We live in hope. And while we hope, we are called individually and as a community to be the peace child in our own communities, to be like Jesus, a place where everyone can meet and be welcome, however different they might be from us and from each other. He is our peace. And if we are in Christ, then we are called to be the peace of the world, to embody peace to be peacemakers, to be the peace child for our community, to be both of our community and of Christ. So this week, this month, peace be with you. Amen.